Great, great. I keep forgetting that. That's great. Thank you. And then, let's see here. <clears throat> All right, oops, hold on a second. Okay, very good, that's them. Slideshow. Mm. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes. So uh, this is this is Len, and um, okay. Go ahead, Len. Uh, so on the left we have Wilhelm Hammershoy's interior with two candles, 1904, oil on canvas, roughly 26 by 21 inches. And on the right, we have Andrew Wyeth's Dodges Ridge, 1947, egg tempura on fiberboard, approximately three and a half by four feet. <clears throat> a haiku focuses on a brief moment in time, juxtaposing two images and creating a sudden sense of enlightenment. I present to you two visual haikus. In Hammershoy's interior with two candles, evening has descended upon a sparsely decorated Copenhagen home. It is 1904, only 13 years since electricity was introduced to private homes in Denmark. Electricity has not come yet to this part of the city, but the homeowners have a beautiful pair of candlesticks, weighty and well-polished, they are the hallmark of this room, its only adornment. Standing proudly in the elegant brass holders, the candles have barely burned. It was only a moment ago that a denizen of the home set them alight, breathing life into an otherwise featureless space. Hammershoy Haiku. The rakish candle seduces window and a door. Their love child? Shadow. It's great. In, in, Wyeth, uh, in Wyeth Dodge's Ridge, a gray turbulent sky threatens a rolling landscape. As in Hammershoy's interior, Wyeth's solitary landscape speaks to human presence and intent. Someone was here with a purpose. They came, they erected this stake with its cross arm and fabric that has degraded over time into tatters. Wyeth haiku, black, feathered, hungry. Did you frighten them, Scarecrow? The wind howls, silence. Yeah, uh, just stunning, really, really stunning. Um, uh, Thank you, Rita. Could I, could I ask you something? Um, was yes. this the first attempt? Um, more or less. I kind of, I, I couldn't get anything going for like two or three days after I picked the pictures. Um, and then I figured out what I wanted to do, and then I just had to hone it a little bit. The, haiku, picked, the haikus took time. You pick the pictures first. I always pick the pictures first. Okay. And I and I let them speak to me for a couple of days, you know, to figure out what I want to say. Uh, really, really striking, uh, Len. Compliments. Thank compliments. You, Thank you. Um, let's go to Sean. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, image number one is titled Moonlight, number 30 Beach Street by Hammershoy, circa 1900, 16 inches by 20 inches, uh, currently at the Met. 
Image number two is Christina's World by YF, 1948, 32 inches by 48 inches, currently at MoMA. These images could be viewed as opposites, each the inverse of the other. <clears throat> An empty nocturnal interior in oil versus a tempera figure in midday landscape, each saturated with the peculiarity of the painter. However, note the structural similarities in both works, in particular the one to three quarter horizontal division of space. The floor in one corresponds to the sky in the other. Both employ an abridged spectrum of tone and chroma. These economies affect a potency in both works. The Hamishaw is strongly vertical. Back and foreground are merged. The shallow rim forces our attention up and forward onto the two-dimensional picture plane. Compare this to Wyeth's Christina's World. A high undulating horizon line suggests an extension of pictures, picture space beyond the hill. A view is cast over and back. The building silhouettes catch and refocus our attention, where an elliptical shape of the, the elliptical shape of the clearing, as though cast down from the sky, draws, <clears throat> draws us down and forward again. A similar visual loop is employed by Hammershoy by a cast shadow and reflected light. His room is illuminated by light reflected onto the walls from the floor. Our gaze moves up the walls where the strong linear shadows cast by mouldings direct us back to the window. The diagonal line of streaming light and cast shadow takes us from window to floor again. Hammershoy uses the word moonlight in the title and completely obstructs our view of the sky. Perhaps a depth of mentalization is invited here. We must imagine a nightscape outside the room, lit by a moon, which itself is a reflecting light from an imagined sun. The luminosity increases with each imagined scene, floor, moon, sun. These images are cast into the viewer's mind as light through the window. Wyeth also engages and guides the viewer's imagination. The obstruction of Christ Christina's face draws us in and back. The power of her gaze is somehow amplified by the curve and twist of her posture. <clears throat> Note the crooked shadow cast by her arm. She is crippled and yet like a broken cello whose music still plays in our mind. The strange combination of helplessness, strength, survival and hints of trauma fascinate and force us to empathize with a faceless figure in an untold story. Yeah, super, really oh, yeah. super, absolutely super. Um, uh, um, if we were stressing the idea of slow looking, the, uh, your essay is a fabulous example of slow looking, but it's not just slow looking, it's reconfigured in a very poetic way. Um, compliments, really, super. Thank you. Super, really, and very austere, very peered down. Um, Kathy is the next one. I didn't uh, get the date on the Wyeth, but I'll just read my own face. Um, how... That's fine, that's fine. Okay, okay. In the two self-portraits that I selected, I found similarities and contrasts. Each artist used a palette of complementary colors, orange and blue. In Hopper's, the colors were more chromatic, whereas in the Wyeth painting, outside of the flesh tone, the complementary colors were muted. Both used strong contrast of values with the darks of the clothing against the lighter background. In each of the self-portraits, the head is turned in the same direction, and both paintings are lit from the left side. However, the vantage point of the viewer is different in each painting. In Hopper's, in the Hopper painting, the eye level of the viewer is slightly above the subject, whereas in the Wyeth painting, the, the eye level is low, looking upward at the subject with the ceiling, the hooks, the cast shadows, cracks in the plaster, and the tonality of the ceiling becoming almost as important as the figure. Hopper's portrait with its curvilinear line of the figure's contour 
is balanced by the straight lines of the door frame and the line of the floor, and Wyatt's portrait is balanced by the large, somewhat empty space of the ceiling. In the Hopper painting, the gaze of the subject is honest, open, approachable, with a slight smile on the face. In the Wyeth painting, most of the face is in shadow with a side, sideward glance, and the mood of the painting seems more dark and mysterious. And that's it. Terrific, <laughs> terrific. Um, two little comments. Um, maybe we'll go one or two more, and then if anyone else wants to say something besides myself, we'll ask you to come in. But two little comments. Um, First one, Kath Kathy, could I ask you a question? If you were just talking about composition, mm -hmm. which composition do you think is more striking? The Wyeth. Yeah, I agree. And the other point is, I don't know if I heard you right, but I don't think that this is a self-portrait. Okay, I, I I actually thought it was. Yeah, that's why I I didn't do I didn't get to do all my homework this week. No, no, no. It it it, it really doesn't matter. Well, it does matter actually, but it, it it doesn't matter because everything you said is right on target. This is a man who um, I think his name is Kerner, mm. and he and the reason I know this is that there was an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum many years ago. Uh, which was called um, Kerner, Kerners and, and Olsons, or Kerner and Olson. And last week I mentioned that Wyeth set up his studio in two, two homes. One of the homes was this man, Kerner. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and then they gave him carte blanche to use the home in any way he wanted to. So he did views out windows, views looking at their house, um, the whole thing. Um, and um, uh, I think Christina, that's the Olsen yeah. character, is also part of this, but a different home. So that's very interesting in that he, his, his studio m moved from where his studio was to these homes. Um, just a very quickly, the last, from my end, that second composition is spectacular. I mean, the high space and yeah. dropping his head lower is, mm -hmm. um, I, find, I find that if I saw something that is a striking composition, so Kathy, this is from my end. I would say to myself, wow, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, yeah. Ah, how come I didn't think of that? Okay, and so, it, so then I've said it enough times. So when I say that in my head, it means it's a good composition. Yeah, I, I mean, and the hooks and the cast shadows, they're all, you know, almost equally important. Your eye goes my eye goes to that hook with the cast shadow because it's surrounded by light, you yes. know. Well I mean, said. Yeah. So, yeah, I love that composition, but I didn't realize it wasn't a self-portrait. I, I, since I know that, I, I couldn't just let it go by. That's all. Sure, sure. Uh, but uh, another thing about the Wyeth, which reiterates something I said earlier, uh, last, last mm -hmm. time, is that in those half tones is so much color. Like if you look towards the bottom of his painting, mm -hmm. it feels like from a distance, it's just dark. But if you squint your eyes, you see lots of different tones there, blue grays, green greens, green grays, blue blacks, green blacks, and this guy was an amazing painter of these half tones. Mm -hmm. um, let's go with Lucia. Hi. So 
as I was studying the two artists, uh, Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth and Edward Hopper, I came across a number of really beautiful quotes uh, from them. And I felt like listening to their quotes would be interesting rather than what I have to say. <laughs> so so I so I'm going to um I'm going to bring those in to what I have to say. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a painting on the right, which is called Letting Her Hair Down by uh, Andrew Wyeth. And this is tempera on panel, about 25 by 28 inches. Uh, Letting Her Hair Down is part of, uh, part of the Helga series. Uh, Wyeth spent 15 years painting in secret Helga Testdorf, uh, his German neighbor in Chats Ford. And this is between the years 1971 and 1985. Helga was 38 when he started painting her and 53 at the end of the series. There are a total of 240 works in uh, various mediums. A couple of years ago, when I first saw this painting at the Forum Gallery, I actually took those pictures, all three of them. Mm. Um, when, I when I first saw the, the Helga painting at the Forum Gallery, I was mesmerized by the quality of the work, the expression Wyeth captured on her face, uh, the rich, earthy skin tones, the luminescent quality of the hair and the unkept workers' hands and fingernails. Um, <clears throat> very few works have captivated me as this piece did. I literally fell in love with a painting. Beautifully expressed. Oscar Wilde said, this is an Oscar Wilde quote, every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not of the sitter. It is not he who is revealed by the painter, in this case, she. It is rather the painter who, on the colored canvas, reveals himself. Um, Andrew Wyeth, I think, drew a lot of inspiration from the Renaissance artists. Uh, he is quoted as saying, I was so much taken by the works of the Renaissance master, Piero della Francesca. Mm. Also, he said, quote, above all, I admired the graphic work of the, the Renaissance genius, Albrecht Dürer. Mm. Uh, his medium <clears throat> of egg temper, I think was his favorite, possibly. I know he did a lot of beautiful watercolors as well, but uh, egg tempera is, is, I think, very hard to work with. And um, he said, quote, there's something incredibly lasting about the material, like an Egyptian mummy. Tempera mm -hmm. is like building, really building in great layers, the way the earth itself was built. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, his paintings have these earthy tones, which, which are present in, in letting her hair down um, and, and desaturated colors. The one thing that the Helga paintings um, remind me of, uh, especially this one, well, actually others in the series are uh, the Botticelli paintings, uh, Primavera and the Birth of Venus. I feel like Helga was Andrew Wyeth's uh, Simonetta Vespucci. Now, how can I help you today? Uh, Wyeth um, sets his subject often, including in this painting, against the geometric back, back, backdrop. The abstract background enhances her fine features and the wistful expression. There's also a cinematic quality to his work, which brings us to Edward Hopper. No one does the abstract geometric backgrounds and the cinematographic feel better than Hopper. 
Hopper and Wyeth were friends, even though Hopper was older, the same generation as N.C. Wyeth, Andrew's father. In a 1965 interview, Wyeth confessed he admired, quote, Edward Hopper more than any painter living today, not only for his work, but because he's the only man I know who actually feels that America can stand on its own. Hmm. Wyeth said Hopper, quote, stripped everything away till there was nothing, till you are filling nothingness with emotion. I'm sorry. We are experiencing difficulties. Please call back at a later time. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs> uh, so the, painting, the painting on the left is called uh, Office in a Small City. It was the only painting uh, that uh, Hopper painted in 1953. It's a solitary figure in a spatial abstraction that represents a modern building with smaller 19th century brownstones in the background. Hopper said to Wyeth, Andy, I've decided that the only thing that interests me is how the sun hits a white wall, end quote. Mm -hmm. I can imagine how some people looking at this painting are compelled to build a narrative around the singular figure in the painting. For me, that person is less important. The subject that speaks to me is the building with its abstract lines, the walls basked in the sun shining on a cloud-free day with a mesmerizing clear blue sky. The angle of the painting is unique and the spatial setting is magnetic. It's a quintessentially American city painted by a quintessentially American artist. Uh, dazzling piece of writing. Um, <clears throat> really dazzling. Um, Thank you. Yeah, really well, dazzling. Uh, most of it just, is quotes. <laughs> but. Okay, just... Um, I just want to add something for those of you who don't know about Helga and this series that Wyeth did. Um, so, and you may not know this, uh, most of you probably do, but it's just worth <laughs> saying this again, is that Wyeth is a very popular American-American um, artist. And when I spoke about him, I tried to give you another point of view, which was that there was something kind of dark in his work, which his popular image didn't take in. Something dark, in at least to me. And so I don't know if you would call this dark or not dark, but the Helga series is a huge amount of pictures about a woman, a next door neighbor, that he does um, on the sly, secretively. No one knows about it. His wife, who knows about everything that he does, doesn't know about this series. Now, you can wonder. You, you you can wonder. Is this on the up and up? Is it actually what I'm saying? Not clear. Not clear. But it's a fantastic <coughs> bit of publicity or a fantastic bit of um, exposure. Uh, renowned American artist does 240 pictures of a next door neighbor on the sly. His wife knows nothing about it nor does most other people. And just what, what is going on here? Who is this woman? What are they doing together? Etc. 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 Um and th there have been exhibits of those paintings and drawings that are really <laughs> wonderful. And those nudes that I showed you last class uh I believe were of her. Mm -hmm. Um Okay, so let's do one more, and then we'll see if we get more people to come in. So this is Ron. Let me un unmute here. 
Um, presence, character, purpose. Such are the engaging qualities of a person, but no less so are these the qualities of the structures we create and the artwork which depicts them. Portraits of people, portraits of buildings. Hammershoi portrays a church, Hopper, a lighthouse. Each is treated with admiration, looked up to, venerated. The composition of both is logical, deliberate, and balanced, an echo of their purpose. They serve to protect and comfort us. In both compositions, a diagonal divides the frame cleanly in half and provides a pivot for the eye. Hammershoi's Baltic red brick church leads the eye downward on a sloping diagonal, descending from the ornate tower down the steep plain of the chapel roof. Hopper's diagonal ascends from the base of the privy through the lower corner of the triangular gable to the upper right corner of the frame. Each artist divides the frame into vertical thirds. Hammershoi does so with the axis of the tower and the peak of the chapel gable. Hopper does this same, utilizing the flashy red chimney pipe and the leaning post, that post providing the only relief to Hopper's relentless verticals. The moods contrast strikingly. The crepuscular Hammershoi with its bare winter tree is ghostly frigid against its warm palette. Hopper's lighthouse, all whites and creams, basks in warm summer sunlight. But those cirrus clouds, in addition to balancing the berm at the lower right, hint at dangerous weather coming in, and his wide-eyed windows are ever vigilant. The Hopper is a substantial oil painting from 1927 titled Captain Upton's House. It's 28 and a half by 36 inches. He drew and painted this subject repeatedly during that period. I have no information on the Hamashoi painting of the red brick church. I've not been able to identify it online. His only other portrait of a church online is that of the neoclassical chapel of the Royal Palace in Copenhagen, a rather unappealing cracker box like structure with a bald paint of a dome, but photos show it to be much more elegant in its interior. It's a very, very beautiful piece of writing uh, and very interesting to start. I think you started by comparing these to people. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, terrific, terrific, and very pared down. Um, uh, it's interesting in the two paintings, the sky is painted in such a different way from the Hammershoi to the Hopper. And um, very good choice. Um, gee, just really excellent. Um, so does anyone have a question or a comment so far? I'd like to keep going because uh, there's a lot of you. So does anyone have a question? Uh, I don't have a question, but I just, I mean, these are both really beautiful paintings and um, <laughs> I, I forgot what I was going to say. I mean, I think <laughs> I just like the way um, you commented about the, the, the clouds, you know, adding you know, the cirrus clouds, adding kind of a, a haunting or you know ominous quality to it you know i mean i think the painting on the left is more somber and the painting on the right is i wouldn't say threatening it's more you know Especially. robust in contrast but it's it's almost more dramatic i mean the hopper one is more dramatic and the and the and the one on the left is uh more stately i don't know i'm just reacting to the pictures they're both beautiful so that's all okay let's let's keep let's could, keep going. Uh, if i could if i could just ask sean question to sean is what, what could you talk about your journey to picking those two pictures the hammershoy moonlight and, and the christina's world and, and how you kind of brought them together i mean primarily i picked those two because they're available to be seen in the in two museums in New York City, and I've seen them, and I had photographs of them in the, of them in the frame. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah, but that but that's a very modest way of saying that they attracted you and you photographed them before this assignment or class or thought. Um, I did, I mean, I take a lot of photographs of paintings, but I, I mean, I think it's important to see the the image in the in the frame if you can. Yeah. And and also seeing the seeing the painting physically opens up the texture of the, the yeah. two-dimensional surface, which is just a completely other experience to, to seeing an image online. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so the next the next person I have is Alan. Yes. Um, as an architect, I've spent much of my career thinking about space and the effect of natural light as how they interplay the design of buildings in their interiors. In college, I used to get so much gratification from drawings I had done of both interiors and exteriors of my projects, illustrating how sunlight penetrates and affects them. Even now, when many presentations are done digitally, I still focus on where the light comes from and how it affects the space at different times during the day. It's interesting that in this class, we're currently discussing artists who utilize space and light with shadows and reflections to create compositions which use these elements to express feeling, moods, and atmospheres. After much <clears throat> consideration, I finally chose on the left, Dust Motes, Dancing and Sunbeams by Wilhelm Hammershoy, painted in uh, 1900, which is 28 inches by 23 inches, and A Woman in the Sun by Edward Hopper, which is 40 inches by 61 inches, painted in 1961. Um, the second here. Um, I lost my place. Both paintings use light and space similarly in some ways, but differently in others, but successfully, which is what attracted me to both. To me, both paintings are timeless. If one knew nothing about the origin of one, uh, the origin, one would be hard pressed to figure out when or where they were painted. Considering the fact that these paintings are separated by more than 60 years and painted by artists of different generations and from different countries, I find that fascinating. Both paintings have interesting compositions that are actually quite simple, but dramatic. In Hammershoy's painting, my eyes are drawn to the white window, the illuminated, illuminated dust motes, and the sunlit pattern on the floor. It's interesting how the heights of the elements of the wall step down and recede as you move your eyes from left to right. The room, as I see it, seems to have a sense of sadness or loneliness. The painting's colors, um, coloring is, most, is almost monochromatic. It reminds me um, of an early, slightly colored photograph. In both paintings, the subjects like the window in Hammershoy's painting and the figure of the woman in Hopper's would be lost without the space that surrounds them. The space gives them more than just context, but an environment that draws you in. The space around the subjects are just as important as the subjects themselves. The large planes in both paintings, the floors and walls, are painted similar, similarly in both works with multiple but subtle, smoothly mixed colors. Although both paintings are somewhat abstract, Hopper takes abstraction to a further degree than Hammershoy. The detailing of the elements in the space, like the pictures on the wall, the drapes, the bed, and the sh shoes, the window, and the landscape beyond are stripped down, creating a simple yet appealing background with the uh, sunbathed nude creates an incredibly striking composition. Hopper illuminates the woman from a window on the right, but all we see is the hint of the window by a narrow portion of a drape. We know that the window is there from the sunlit area on the floor. The long shadows behind her and the must bed suggest the scene is early morning and that she is recent, has recently awakened. 
The cool colors of the walls, the floor, and the landscape contrast with the warm colors of the figure, the sunlit area on the floor, and the drape on, on the right. The woman, with a cigarette in her hand, is looking out. We can only imagine what she is looking at. We wonder if she's really looking or just gazing deeply in thought. Um, <clears throat> Alan, I, if I could, if I could be so bold as to make a suggestion, your writing is really wonderful in this, and um, I would say that when you visit museums or galleries or wherever you travel, um, you should pick out things and write about them. Um, it, this is very observant. And um, <clears throat> I think that um, writing piques your curiosity, not your, but everyone's curiosity, and um, makes you very conscious. And this, this is terrific, terrific piece of writing. Thank you, thank you. From my point of view, if you took a look at the hopper and let's say you got rid of most of this picture and just made it a vertical picture instead of a horizontal one and you just concentrated on three inches to the left and seven inches to the right of this woman and made it a vertical frame so if you put that picture instead of the Hammershoy to the left, and you have this picture to the right, oh. um, this picture is way more interesting. And yeah. it's the space that does it. And it, the space acts as a character in the painting. <clears throat> it's a very, it's a very interesting idea. It's like um, visual thinking or visual philosophy it's not you know maybe edward hopper couldn't describe this maybe he couldn't describe this in the way that alan described it but he describes it visually and the use of space is um super um so the next one i have is dean I don't hear anything. Yeah, I'm not hearing Dean. Right. Must be muted. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, my apologies. Windows that open and close and are just the right size, give you a pleasurable, sensual connection to other people, to nature, to natural light and air. In a wall, a door or archway celebrates the special right to remain alone or invite another over the threshold. Now, Hammershoy was certainly enamored with the wooden doors and multi-part, multi-pane outswinging casement windows of Strandgata 30, his old Vermeer era building, unevenly settling as it was. During the time he lived and painted there, he apparently wanted to celebrate the almost cinematic breadth of physical contrasts of light, as this courtyard composition illustrates on the left. From the gloomy darks in the lower right, the dark stair bordering the bright courtyard, up to the single casement, full open, a single sunbeam creating that contrast with the darkness of the interior. On the walls, Hammershoy's brush strokes lend a soft shimmering texture in multiple muted hues, describing the soft stucco and painted wood window frames. We psychologically speaking are left to believe the artist loved his solitude, loved the meditative play of light on this architectural home. While in the Wyeth, portrait of Henry Teal, we have a portrait of a man actually enjoying that feeling of connection at his open window 
elbow on sill, gazing out over the land or sea. Inside with his sparely furnished dining room, two chairs, a trio of decorative plates, a large rectangular wooden table draped with two layers of cloth, a door just slightly open, suggests only a hint of openness to extra company. Next to the Hammershoy, you see in both compositions, the drama begins in the dark lower right corners and a splash of light holding the most drama. The balance of each painting washed in multiple muted hues, again in gentle modulations, easy on the eyes as illuminated in indirect light. Does the Wyeth painting hold any clues to whether Henry Teal lives alone or with someone? And what might be he thinking, what might he be thinking as he sits and looks out his window? One thing we know is Henry allowed Wyeth into his home like the others. And although time weathered his face, he cared enough to put on a collared, collared shirt, yellow pinstripe vest, and to pass the time looking out to a scene in which he must have found pride and satisfaction even in solitude. While eyes are windows to the soul, a well-placed window is the eye to your world and an open door, a connection to community. Could you read that last part again? Sure. While eyes are windows to the soul, a well-placed window is the eye to your world and an open door, a connection to community. Uh, Dean, that's terrific. Could you send that to me? Send that last part to me. Sure. Um, the, uh, one, one thing that occurs to me, and for, first off, the choice of these two together is brilliant. And, but one thing that occurs to me is that <clears throat> these two pictures have a narrative quality, um, but they don't seem like illustration to me. So they seem formal and abstract. So there is something that's narrative here, but it's the the intrinsic part of this narrative is X and the X is unclear, it's unknown. Um, and also the, the tonalities are very similar. I don't even know if one influenced the other. I would say no, I would say not. In other words, I would say that Wyeth did not know of Hammershoy, but I could be mistaken. Um, well, this is terrific. And um, windows are amazing. Um, the next one I have is Kristen. Um, I do not know the sizes of either of these or the titles of either of these. The painting on the left is one that um, I saw in the Hopper exhibit a few weeks ago before the class started. And I took a number of photos and this is one of the photos and I kept going back to it. So I chose that and the Hammershoy on the right. Um, and both of these paintings kept me looking at them and wondering as I continued to look. Both appear to be women at the end of their days caught in a moment of quiet. They seem as if they might be exhausted, but perhaps for very different reasons. The hopper, maybe an evening out, her hat and perhaps her red coat are in the foreground. I imagine she has just dumped them off and is caught in the middle of moving to take off the next thing or maybe to stand. At first, I thought she was holding the mantle, but the closer I looked, it seems that she is not, just that she is raising or lowering her arm. Maybe she has just tossed her hat down and is about to reach down to remove her shoes. In contrast, the woman in the Hammershoy painting seems very still. She has an air of peace about her, although she looks as if she may have just completed a hard day of work and is finally sitting down to take a breath. Even though the surroundings are 
very different, the spatial arrangement in, in these paintings is similar. Both have dark rectangular space on the left. Um, you see maybe through the window, the shutter, in the Hammershoy painting, a shadow from a door or a wall. That provides some mystery in that painting. Some horizontal shapes are on the right in the furniture and the colors are similar. The women are both at the center of our focus, but the backgrounds are darker and soft, are softer and less defined. The darkest points in both paintings are their clothing in the foreground. It's so dark and black. The surrounding details create balance as well as interest about who these women are. But it is very striking to me that it seems that neither Hopper nor Hammershoy seem to have given much careful attention to either woman's hair. And I find that very curious. While both of these paintings have an air of mystery about the women and what they've done with their days, the Hammershoy is much more spare and leaves me with more questions about exactly who she is. The quality of the paint in both makes the paintings have feel lightness, some lightness about them, almost ethereal. Hammershoy has used a much closer range of values, so it feels more subdued and peaceful. And the entire painting appears to me to be scumbled. There is so much layering of paint and detail throughout. He has given a great deal of attention to both the figure of the woman and the walls and the other details. Yet the woman's clothing, the folds in her blouse, and the are the pinnacle of his his attention. And the same is true of the Hopper painting. Her shoulders and her dress are the most refined parts of that painting and the layers and layers that you can see in the colors and the shades of paint. He did use, Hopper used color throughout. And although it, most of his attention has been devoted to the woman's back in the dress, there is not the same level of emotion and depth to that painting as there is in the Hammershoy to my eye. In the Hopper painting, I was drawn in by the incredible quality of light of this woman's skin and dress. And while it is realistic, there's also something that feels kind of magical and mystical about her. I can almost hear the rustle of her dress. As I gaze at both of these women caught in a moment of silence, I wonder what came before now and what lies ahead for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Beautifully written, uh, really um, beautiful. Um, Kristen, could I ask you, did you know of Hammershoy, the artist? Before, I did not. Before. No. But he's quite interesting, no? Oh, yes. I have... I had a very, very difficult time choosing from among his works because there are so many that are so beautiful. Um, and in the in the in the immortal words of Len Ross, I from last week, I feel like the more you look, the more you see. I think you might have said that about why Len, but I found Hammershoy to be that for me. Just the more you look. It was about the hopper, actually. So we, we oh, was from, we've touched on all three now. <laughs> Full so, beautiful, beautiful, everyone. Really, really beautiful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Absolutely <laughs> terrific. Wonderful. Um, Thanks. So, Dory. All right. <clears throat> uh, I picked these two images because they seemed so different from each other. Though the picture of the man, at, I don't have the information that, that you told us to have, the, the dimensions and so forth. But anyway, um, though the picture of the man at first seemed to me very dark, it is diffused with daylight. The light of the crescent moon is weaker and more yellow except for the window, the light on the grass, city lights on the horizon and the crescent moon. The texture and colors of the man's bed and coat draw me in but the texture of the grass in the other painting I almost overlooked in the surrounding darkness. The man in the shadows of the dark room is serious, 
his gaze alert and present, looking and leaning toward the source of light. The paint, the paint looks many layered, maybe tempera, I don't know. While the moon painting looks as if it may be a watercolor, the painting of the man has great depth. The moon painting feels flatter. That's all. Um, you know, um, one thing that occurs to me, which seems to be worth mentioning, um, the realism here is very selective. The person who did this, these two pictures, didn't paint everything they saw. Yeah, there's, right. there's a there's a lot left out. Okay, so um, that left out part is beautiful and wonderful, and I think good writing leaves things out. Um, good art leaves things out so what you select shows something about who you are it shows something about your self-portrait as one of the students said mm -hmm. and um i think i think that's what i what i can add to this um and i remember years ago i had a student who was very interested in the statement that i just made and one day she came to me in a drawing class and she she was a very animated student and she came to me and she she threw her hands up like this and said simon how do you know what to leave out <laughs> um the next one is carol <laughs> <laughs> Carol, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry. Okay. These are two women staring into nothingness. These two paintings are part of a body of paintings of women from the rear. We've actually seen two just before. Hammershoy did many. Hopper did fewer and Wyeth a few that I have found. And I guess I became somewhat intrigued by them. The first, the left, is Hammershoy's young woman seen from the back. It's oil on canvas, 24 by 20, and was painted in 1904. The second is Andrew Wyeth's French twist. It is dry brush on paper, 22 and a half by 28 and a half, and was painted in 1967. Both of these are paintings of the artist's wives. Coincidentally, I think, both women have their hair in a French twist. Hammershoy paints in his typical muted tones. The light comes from the left, lights the woman's neck and disappears into the dark of her dress. The light on the nape of her neck makes it the focal point of the picture and emphasizes that she is turned away. She holds a tray and stands by a sideboard, but there's no sense of what she's doing there. Even she doesn't seem to know and is looking off to the wall or beyond. <laughs> Wyeth paints his wife sitting at a long table. Her hands are on each side of the table, but there's no evidence of what she's doing or where she is. This is one of Wyeth's dark paintings and the light seems to come only from the woman herself. Her coat is luminous, nothing else is. Again, the light emphasizes that we see only her back and while it's difficult to tell what she's looking at, the background does have some shape, is almost like a dark cellar-like space, but it does seem as if she's looking at something. It may be the way her hands are placed or that there is a space that she can look into. In that way, Wyeth has created great depth in this painting. Unlike Hammershoy, whose whole painting is very refined, very geometric, Wyeth creates a rustic setting, but uses his dry brush to put incredible detail into his wife's coat and in her hair. She is the indelible living center of this picture. 
Hammershoy's wife is also the center, but she is the darkness in an otherwise light space. Thus, she feels almost lost. Wyatt's wife is not lost, but we still don't know where she's going. I find it very difficult to separate whether each of these artists and Hopper are using their wives just as models or and or saying are saying something about their wives. It's well hard said. well said. I, it's hard for me to speculate since I have read about both of these wives inevitably affecting my reactions to the paintings. Wyeth's wife was a very strong character who was totally she she titled all his paintings, she kept all his books, which also makes it very hard to think that 280 Helga paintings didn't come to her attention. <laughs> um, Mrs. Hammershoy, on the other hand, there, the speculation I heard from Michael Palin was that she was a disturbed person, mentally disturbed maybe, and that that's why he's painting her from the back a lot and in darkness. That's it. Maybe maybe she was disturbed because she was painted so many times. That could be so still. That could be so still. I I was struck by what you said. You said um, about the Hammershoy. You said something like, "Even she doesn't seem to know what she's looking at." Right. It's right. that's a terrific statement. I really like that. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the, your choice of these two is wonderful, and I agree with you that it it you can wonder what these women, what were they portraits of these women, or how how do they communicate? But just visually, they're amazing together, really amazing. Um, um, so I have Sue next. Mm. And I only have to say, I had so little time this week. I was out of town several days and I'm working, but so mine's a little more superficial, but I'm happy to share. Sue, just keep it to less than four minutes, okay? It won't be a problem. Okay. <laughs> so the first one, I don't, there was no title for it. They're both by Andrew Wyeth. And I feel that both show his deep understanding of the people that he's painted. Um, first with Woman and the Cat, how deeply empathetic and insightful of Wyeth to paint this woman, whom one could say is homely and coarse, in a moment of great tenderness. He clearly captures her large, rough-hewn hands gently holding this kitten to her breast. You can see the deformity of her calloused fingers. He captures in her hair that precise texture that is not glossy, but somewhat gritty. And yet we can see all the strands and her ear poking out. She is placed in a barren, squalid setting with prominence given to the layered textures of the peeling wall covering. In contrast to the somber, dirty-looking gray-green of the walls, her hair, and the kitten, he uses light to great effect on her face and garments. And you can catch a bit of that salmon color reflected on the wall. While her dress looks soiled, the color descends from her neck in much the way of paintings of women of higher station. He uses light and shadow on her face so that we see its dimpling, but also can appreciate her majestic nose. Such care is taken in the painting of her crippled, coarse hands. One can feel the calluses. With his use of light, he has created great contrast between her large, deformed fingers and the vulnerability of the kitten. Christina looks down. The kitten looks up, and that line is mirrored by the shape of her neckline. I'm deeply moved by this painting and the depth of his feeling for this woman that it evokes. And that happens to be Christina of Christina's world. The next, Andrew Wyeth, Sea Boots, 29 inches by 19 and 3 quarter inches, 
Tempra on panel, and it's in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Great presence created by the absence. The boots are not randomly placed, but as if the body were lifted right out of them. A sense of a man of some size and bulk. These boots have been worn a great deal. The weathered leather, leather and tattered linings. You can feel the musculature of the missing person they belonged to. There is a surreal quality as well as an abstract one. The triangle of the house or barn against the block of light tan sky. The lines in the dirt going towards the house. Our eyes are tricked. Is it flat ground or a hill or even a wall behind the boots? It doesn't quite make sense as I look at it. As always, great detail to the textures of ground, shells, leather, and material. I believe by placing those boots as he has so prominently in the forefront, Wyeth is demanding that we think of the person that wore them. Terrific, really terrific. Um, there's so many things you could respond to in what you said, uh, Sue. Just the only, I don't want to take up a lot of time. The only thing I can, resp I can say is that in the painting with the boots, the, the bottom horizontal line is the line that separates you from what's inside the picture. So if those boots are the same size and are placed lower to the bottom line, those boots feel like they're closer to you. The closer those boots are to the bottom, the closer they feel to the viewer. And so what he's done is, I like, I, I try to emphasize in introducing his work that he's very interested in juxtaposition. So he's juxtaposing the boots and their up close presence with the house, the sky, way back or not so way back. Um, I like your choice, the choice of the two pictures very much. Um, let's do the next one, which is Rita. Uh, the first painting by Hammershoy is from 1897 and it's called Room. The second painting by Hopper 1932 is called Room in New York, 1932. Mm. In these works of Hammershoy and Hopper, there is simplicity and depth, subdued emotion and extraordinary observation of what we might initially dismiss as ordinary. In mm. each a modest interior with its inhabitants, table, chair, window, door, a painting or two on the wall. In each, we are voyeurs stealing a glimpse into a private room, a private life, an interior human landscape. Hammershoy's room is a sanctuary of elegant Danish plainness, ethereal northern light and organized stillness, soft cream walls, aged amber wood, muted green silk sofa, a lovingly polished table. Each beloved piece of furniture is perfectly placed. The woman at the room center, serene, self-contained, contemplative, eternal, is an organic part of that universe. In contrast, Hopper's room in depression era New York City is cramped and unwelcoming. It is night and the electric light casts a brittle brightness. The sparse furnishings and the stylishly dressed couple seem barely able to fit within the studio walls. The woman's finger idly touches a solitary key of the piano, a 
but there is no music played to nourish the soul. The man buried in the newspaper is either reading the ever worsening economic news or looking for a job or perhaps pretending to read in order to avoid talk of mm. an ex existence that has turned disappointing. Mm. The lonely silence in the room is troubling. A shabby wooden door, firmly closed, looms large at the painting center. Is there no way out? Mm. Hopper captures the ethos and the pathos of the naked city during hard times. Peek in any window there, and you might sense the same polite, guarded alienation and dispiritedness. Hmm. Well, that's beautifully written. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, Rita, well, I wanted to ask you something. What I was saying earlier, do you think I'm right as to how um, I, I was talking about two paintings earlier, and I talked about how selective the artists were. Do you think I'm right about that? Well, selective, are you meaning selective in what elements they choose to include? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think not only that, but the way the, the elements are then condensed or framed Yes, so you agree. You have the same elements in both these paintings, but the one on the right seems very um, claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, if I took it further beyond visual, beyond painting, wouldn't you say the same thing about writing? Absolutely. So in other words, I remember once reading something that um, Truman Capote said about writing. He said that um, if he imagined a room, he would try to imagine the element in the room that stood out to him, whether it was a window or light or whatever. And that's what he would start with. That's right. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Unless you want to ramble, it makes a lot of sense. There's always yeah. more to say about every everything that you comment on, but yeah. yeah. But it's it's interesting how there is a um an, an analogous motif going on between the visual and the literary. I I, I think. Um Okay, let's let's go to um, David. Um, David. Apologies, my my daughter just came in oh. to say goodnight. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I thought right you, at that moment. I thought you were on a different channel. No. Okay. So. Um... So on the left is uh, image one. We have Hopper's House at Dusk. It's an oil on canvas that's held at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. And it dates from 1935. And on the right is image two. We have Wyeth's uh, The Wind from the Sea, dating from 1947. And that's uh, Temper on Hardboard at the National Gallery. In image one, we are given signs of life inside the house or apartment building but the evidence is indirect. We see lights in some, but not all rooms, and what may be the silhouette of a person might just as easily be a globe. The title House at Dusk gives information about the quality of light and its persistence. In minutes, in minutes the sky will lose its battle to encroaching night, ominously pretended by the wave of dark trees that occupy a third of the composition. <clears throat> Excuse me. The trees double as a wave about to overtake the house, or perhaps a cloud of darkness, a pyroclastic flow that cannot be stopped. Like the turning of day into night, it is inevitable and threatens to subsume the house and its occupants. Here, the interior of the house is a safe harbor. The windows, despite their opacity, promising life's continuation following the retreat of natural light. 
The depiction of the trees, the implications of the light, all suggest a world in motion that turns menacing or peaceful. The chimney crenellations of the house, a defiant gesture of the home's status as lights keep in times of darkness. In image two, first impressions may lead one to think it is the opposite of image one. <clears throat> The stunning beauty of the diaphanous curtains, the evident motion of the wind engaging with the interior of the house. Here we have signs of life outside of the house via the sun's diffuse and pale illumination and in the wind's activity made visible by its effect on the curtains, uh, motion made manifest in a static image. Ghosts of hummingbirds flutter on the curtains, seeking their daily sucker, living mm -hmm. perpetually on the sheer fabric as long as the tattered threads should hold. The phantasms alternately shine via the sunlight or exist in shadow, a result of the same forces. There is a crack in the wall to the left. There are imperfections in what may be painted over portions of the window. The gray undertones of the whole work suggest a continuity between the inner and outer spaces. Is all normal or is something in irretrievably broken and no longer attainable? The wind is identified in the title as being from the sea, <clears throat> Excuse me, but there is only a hint of a body of water on the left side of what is visible through the window. As with the foliage in, in image one, the trees to the right stand in as, in as a pseudo wave being driven toward the house. And here the dark shapes of masted ships loom atop them in the distance. The world approaches what might be considered an abandoned domicile if it weren't for the, the rutted tracks in the field, evidence of recent use and occupation. <laughs> The two images suggest in turn a sheltered and an open mind, with the pleasures and pitfalls of each perhaps more apparent to the detached viewer. Though the vantages implicate the viewer as a participant, in image one as a viewer from an apartment perhaps across the street, and as a trapped soul behind the eyes of the observer in image two. In both cases, we are subjected to the same forces as the implied subjects of the paintings. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um... David, do either one of these make you think of music? Could you say that one more time? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Do either one of these make you think of a musical counterpart? Um, that's a good question. I'm, I, um... I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, yeah. it just occurred to me. I, you know, the, the types of things in terms of like structure, ornamentation, those types of things, uh, you know, come to mind for sure. But I, it would be, um, I mean, there's always like uh, compositional relationships that you can make, uh, you know, across across the uh, genres to be sure. But yeah, it was just it was just us throwing out a thought. Um, let's go to Kathleen. I think there are two Kathleen's, aren't there? Oh, okay. uh, that one's me. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I've chosen Hammershoy's Interior with Woman at uh, Piano and Andrew Wyeth. <clears throat> I'm sure you know which is which. Um, th this painting is called Bra uh, Braids. Um, let's see, Hammershoy's is 16 by 20 and Wyeth's is 22 by 16. So they're, you know, kind of medium, <laughs> medium size. Um, <laughs> I have to apologize for <laughs> braids because I couldn't get a whole, I couldn't get a picture of the full canvas that had good color. If I found one that had good color, it couldn't be copied. Anyway. I think this looks pretty good. Yeah, I, it has the important stuff. But if you haven't seen it, it's in a, a bigger square. She's a little bit more than half of it. And it's, it's solid, a solid dark color. So, okay, I chose these because, well, I think they're both beautiful, mostly. Um, I mean, mostly that's the reason I chose them. Um, and, but they're both slightly different from their typical, uh, the artist's typical work. Um, the, the similarities are, oh wait, first, uh, the thing that, in, that struck me immediately the first time I saw both of these was, um, the stark environment, the uh, the loneliness and isolation. 
it, I was surprised to hear that people didn't see the darkness in Wyeth's paintings. I, if I look at it right, it looks uh, uh, kind of depressing, really. So I choose not to look at it that way. Um, okay, so the, they have several things in common. Um, they both emphasize architecture or not, well, they both do, but uh, Hammerstoy more so. Um, Hammerstoy's paintings are, uh, ar architecture is central and most of his lines are rectilinear. Uh, they're almost abstract paintings. And in Wyeth's, um, it, architecture is important, but it's more subtle. And he also includes more organic shapes. Um, in Wyeth's, we're more drawn to the people in, um, <clears throat> in Hammer Shoes, where we just were drawn, well, not entirely when they have figures, but a lot of his, his paintings were just looking at, I feel like an abstract painting with almost only architecture. Um, they were both fascinated with directional uh, light and windows. Hammer Shoes light is subtle. His paintings glow with more diffuse light and Wyeth's uh, light is more striking. In fact, I, I think of them as being on either side of Vermeer. Um, uh, well, 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 <laughs> for Hammershoy, he's more subtle, uh, more diffuse. And then um, for Wyeth, he's more high contrast. So he's, Ver, uh, Vermeer is somewhere in between. Um, those are, oh, one more thing. They both use muted colors with limited palettes but uh, Wyeth uses them more dramatically. And he, uh, Wyeth's palette tends to be a little warmer and Hammershoy's cooler. Uh, so those are the similarities. The most striking difference between them, I think, is the treatment of figures. Um, Wyeth gives us an uh, intimate view and Hammershoy's uh, is more distant. For Hammershoy, people seem to be just objects in an architectural geometric setting. Um, the woman at the piano, uh, with her, there's no real engagement, I shouldn't say no, little engagement between the figure and the painter or between the figure and the viewer. Uh, we don't know anything about her, about her character. Um, if, if you think about, at least if I think about the figure at all, I think that they're absorbed in whatever they're, uh, they're absorbed, absorbed in something and not aware of their surroundings. With Wyeth, people are central. Um, the people engage with the viewer and the person engages with the painter as well. We feel like, we feel as though uh, Wyeth cares about his models and knows them. They're individuals. Um, Helga uh, draws us in, and for me, I feel her inner strength. I feel like she's a person who's done her duty, worked hard all of her life, and has accepted that. I chose Woman at the Piano among all of Hammerstoy's paintings uh, because I, I think it's the most beautiful. For one thing, I love the color, the gray violet, and I like the way the yellow the little lump of yellow butter um, contrasts and makes both of them. They're more interesting. They both set off the other. And it, it wouldn't be nearly as nice a painting without that yellow butter. <laughs> um, there's harmony. I knew you'd get to the butter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice it for a long time. Yeah, I was just about to say when when you ended, if you ended, what about the butter? What about the butter? <laughs> no, I ha I haven't ended. <laughs> oh, one um, there's one quote uh, just to emphasize this sort of uh, lack of engagement with <clears throat> models. One thing that Hammershoy said, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but he said um, that rooms were so lovely even without people, and then he said maybe even more so without people. <laughs> so that tells you something about how he feels about people. Um, and the, or rooms. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you could look at it that way too. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons I picked this uh, from among his other paintings is that this is the most intimate. Uh, the figure is a bit larger and more important in this uh, room and the space isn't overwhelming. There's a balance between rectilinear and curvilinear uh, lines and balance of light and dark. But I also, I love that chair. It's graceful and I just, I love it. That's one of the reasons I chose it. So in braids, um, feeling dominates the picture and we engage immediately with Helga. The beauty and complexity of the color of her skin is wonderful and the draftsmanship is amazing. So uh, braids is one of the most finished and polished of his paintings um, compared to a lot of, of his more watercolor ones are more sketchy. Uh, he paints her in exacting detail uh, up to the oil and the hair along her face. It's, you know, it would be oilier next to her face. The color is uh, a lovely harmony of background hair, face and sweater. The entire painting is warm. Even her, I thought her eyes were blue, but when I look at it really close up, I'm, it's possible it's a diluted olive, um, olive green. In fact, I think the whole painting can be done in red, yellow, olive green and white. Um, and she takes up more than half of the camp, very little bit, uh, more than half of, the, half of the canvas, which emphasizes her importance and is more satisfying than if it was a 50-50. Um, like someone else said, the more I looked at this and wrote about it, the more, the more beautiful they became. And I really, I love both of them. Thank you. Just terrific. Uh, I asked you the same question I asked someone else before. I think it was Kristen. Did you know of Hammershoy before the class? Nope. No. I don't think I've ever even seen his name. Okay. So, so one response that I have to what you said is that I agree with what you're saying about Hammershoy, um, about his being more distant from these people, but it's not so distant that I would feel cold. And it is still mysterious. So I would want to go up to the other side of the piano and look towards the front so I could see her face. I, I, would, I have the curiosity to want to enter the painting, yeah. mm -hmm. stand well, near her piano and look at the front of her face. Yeah. Okay. So it's not that he's precluding you from doing that. He's just di distancing you and his subject is deep inside the picture. Yes. So, um, but I, I think you did very well. And I think the juxtaposition is terrific. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next one I see is um, Jason. Okay, on the left is a, a Hammershill painting called Five Portraits. And then the other hoppers has been mentioned before, off to the small city. I took a different approach from everybody else today. My approach is I'm standing in a museum looking at these paintings. What am I thinking as I stand and look at them? And by the way, I haven't seen the Hopper exhibition because I'm in Los Angeles and unfortunately I couldn't, my vision doesn't go that far. So, but what I saw in the Hopper, I want to add to what was done before, but I have a different perspective. As I stand there and look at it, the, the lines are very clean. The geometric lines are great, it's color. And he clearly wants us, the, the viewer to look at what the person is seeing. You know, the building across the street, the beautiful sky. And you notice that, and it's partially covered by our faces, but to the right of it, you, the, the view goes beyond the wall, which the person can't see, so we can see from that direction. On the other hand, I place a greater emphasis on the person in there, because it's his perspective. In a way, he's alone, he's daydreaming. When he looks at his colors, this is what he projects he might want to see. And he also noticed the color tones of his face and his arms. You know, they're very light like everything else. And his desk is practically clean. 
So the focus is on, he's sitting there daydreaming, look at this beautiful scenery. And part of what he sees is what he would like it to see. Because in real life, we know these walls are too clean. There's no rain. If they've been there for years, there's no dirt. And you look at the building across the way, it's too pretty. It's too beautiful. Everything on the roof is symmetrical. Nothing is turned over. You don't see any cracks around the windows. So uh, this is what he's visioning. He may be alone envisioning it. So I think this is a two-part, two-parter. One, you want what we want to see, but we have to look at what the person in the chair is seeing. So I think they go together and the emphasis may be on the on the what we see, but I think we have to look at what he sees. And well, I think so. that sort of uh, leads us on. So that it, so that's why I, I looked at it right away. I knew what I wanted to do it, but in some ways there's a good contrast to the hammer shell, even though it may not look like it on the surface, because the hammer shell is five portraits, five different people. You notice they're looking in different directions. That they act, although some of them have uh, glasses of wine and their clothing may be similar, but it's you could have five different portraits. So why did he put them together? So we're talking about visual perception. And I look at visual perception, what do the eyes see? So on the hopper, we're trying to see the view out the window. Here, it's different. We don't see what they see because they're looking at us. And so why did he do mm. that? Why did he focus mm. that? Because this is different from all the other paintings that we saw. And I think the darkness adds to this. It's sort of a mystery to this is what's really going on here. These these are five you know, professional people, presumably. And you notice there's different facial hair on some of them. And the one on the right has none. And you know, so so he throws them all into one painting. Uh, but again, we're asked to see what is what are they looking at? So we're left to guess that, but it's sort of stately. It reminded me of painting from the 1600s of Dutch burgers. Which, in a way, you know, they're they're together. There's a certain unity here, but here, so there's a disparateness here. And I like the idea that we here we're given the choice, unlike in the hopper, as to what they see. So we can only guess at what they see. And you notice their eyes are looking in different directions. So I and I I didn't spend a lot of time on research because I wanted to see what I saw. But I I did a quick look online. It's interesting. The Hammershaw painting, the five portraits, is so popular that there were a bunch of sites selling prints of this painting, which was actually found interesting. I was tempted to get one for $10, but I, I didn't order one. So, so, but I like the idea is that he's leaving it up to us with the dark contrast and the colors and the eyes. In fact, if you look closely at the structure of the faces, there's some similarity to the noses. So he's trying, on one hand saying they're very disparate because of his colors in the face, but the other hand, they have something in common. So, which we're left to, to draw you know, our own with the eye. So I like his dark color. It really accentuates it. The tone, it's it's much darker than gray. And uh, what I this is what I would like to see in person to get a better feel because I expect there's more color in the faces uh, than uh, than we see here. Yes, I I believe this painting might be in Denmark. Oh, well, that's <clears throat> I think I think I'm I'm guessing Denmark. Um, but we we should look that up. But I I like the fact that you've contrasted where these people are looking, as opposed to in the hopper where the man is looking. It's a very interesting point of view. Um, thank you, thank you, really. Um, so the next one I see is Peter. Um, hi, um, I chose uh, two Hopper paintings. I, I wasn't familiar with the Hammershoy uh, work, but I will become more familiar with it now. Um, so I chose the two Hopper paintings because <clears throat> I just love Hopper, and I just uh, went to his show for the second time, and uh, I love these paintings. So, um, so let's see. Um, alienation. This is the one word that I think applies to almost every Hopper painting I've ever seen. Almost every one of his, every one of his pictures, each in their own setting, seem to tell a story as if they were capturing a scene from a depressing movie. I chose the painting on the left. I, I, I could not find the name of the painting on the left or the, or the dimensions. Uh, the painting on the right is uh, Nighthawks 33 and an eighth by 60. It's in the Art Institute of Chicago. 
Um, anyway, I chose the painting on the left <clears throat> because I've never seen a painting that captures melancholia, alienation, and romance all in one image. He uses variations of the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, to ge generate the strongest emotions that they are subdued or slightly altered, which casts an air of gloom over the whole scene. Adding to the gloom and alienation is the way the woman is portrayed. She is facing away from us and her head is tilted slightly downward. She is sitting in a rocking chair, making her a sad stranger who seems to be waiting for something. To me, in this painting, the icing on the cake is the brilliant white vase with the bouquet of flowers in it. Our eyes are drawn immediately to it, making it the focal point of the painting. It embodies contrast on every level, hope versus despair, love versus rejection, brilliance versus darkness. The story in this picture is of a woman sitting alone off to the side, feeling as if she is in the corner of, of the room, punishing herself, surrounded by emptiness, em an empty table behind her and ro rows of empty windows in front of her, <clears throat> and the other buildings in her view too far away driving home the lack of intimacy in her life. I love the way Hopper uses shadow to dramatize the scene. The single rectangle of light coming from the right window spotlights the vase and the woman, making sure we get how powerfully sad uh, she might be feeling. <clears throat> in Nighthawks, uh, I'll say, listening to last week's, I listened to last week's um, class and there was a discussion about what a masterpiece is and I was thinking that to me um, great art or a masterpiece is art that first seduces you and then makes you think and if there was ever a painting that does that it's this one four people together in a cafe not being more than 10 feet away from each other but they but they cannot be more alienated from each other than they are here. Hop, Hopper seems to be giving us an inside scoop on the, on the scene, but the way it is painted makes the diner seem like a cage that, that we are looking into and we must stay out of. The way the glaring yellow is contrasted with the dark blue outside, behind, and on top of the cafe, and the green trim surrounding the cafe makes the interior of the cafe feel harsh and cold, adding the distance to the people in the cafe, adding to the distance the people in the cafe uh, feel from each other. The customers are all lost in their own thoughts. Every object in the whole picture fits perfectly into the composition and adds to the sense of loneliness. The salt and pepper shaker, the napkin holder sitting together, but they are sitting away from any of the com any of the com sitting away from any of the customers. And maybe I'm anthropomorphizing here a little bit, but it seems like the uh, all of those elements on the on the counter, they feel ignored and alone too. <laughs> and this painting <laughs> and this painting, everyone's head is tilted slightly downward. No one is happy. <laughs> on a side note, um, I read that this painting was completed in January of 42. A month, a month or so after Pearl Harbor was attacked, which may have contributed to the sense of gloom and anxiety spreading across the whole country uh, at that time. And one more footnote to this. Um, there's a book I read um, by Olivia Lang called um, Funny Weather, Art in an Emergency is the, is the subtitle. And she reviews various artists and she talks about Hopper and loneliness and um, what is brilliant about the way she writes about Hopper and loneliness and alienation is that she compares it to 2020 and how social media is making us all feel somehow more alienated. And just the way she ties these two things together, um, you know, five billion have ac five billion people on the planet have access to the internet and social media, but more people seem to feel more alone because of it. it. It's a really, it was really moving and it was a great, um, a great book. And that's all I have to say. Okay, very, very nice, very good. 
I particularly like your point about um, a masterpiece first seduces you and then gets you to think. I have a little trouble thing. hearing you because I dropped my AirPod. I, what I said is that I particularly like your sentence that a masterpiece first seduces you and then gets you to think. So the last... I, I know we're going a little longer, but just bear with me. The last one is Lucy. Lucy, are you still here? Hello? Lucy? Her screen is on, but she's not there. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm not sure what to do here, but um, they're an interesting juxtaposition. These two images. Um, maybe we'll get back to this with Lucy another time. Um, well, I, I just leave leave the screen on. I, I. It just occurs to me to say this. Um, and this is something I absolutely feel. This is the best student presentation I've ever heard in the whole time I've been doing this class. And it might have something to do with the pictures that you've chosen or the three artists that I've chosen or theme of the solitary, which was chosen quite by accident. Um, if you remember, I had planned more than one class, and it seemed to me that the exhibit on Danish art sort of wasn't umphy enough to me. So I put that together with the next two artists and created a different theme, which was on solitary. So the, the theme is one that I made up. But that doesn't explain your writing, which is just first rate. And if someone was to ask me about what the class is like, and I, I said that, well, the students respond to a certain presentation and their response is short but intense, I would play this the tape of this class. It's really super. Next week, we're going to, I'm going to present on um, Soutine and Modigliani. Great. So I'll present that the whole class. And then the next class, you will choose two images and speak about them. And if they're as good as this, you're, you're amazing. Um, so, so that's my plan. Next week, I'm going to present on these two artists, and the week after, you're going to have, having sent me two slides, you're going to present just in the way you did tonight. Um, I think that this is fine, that we've gone way past 8.30, and um, uh, I love this. This is, this is as good as it gets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye. -bye. Terrific. Really terrific. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, bye. 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 Thanks, really. Thank you. Good night. Um. Rita, this is amazing. Yes. What a what a performance. Everyone was tipped up. Yes, it's so enjoyable. And what's also interesting 